So I'm going to pick up where I left off in the previous video and finish implementing the coin flipper contract. Now the first thing that I'm going to do is define a couple of variables. First, I'm going to define a variable of type uint called wager, which is the amount that is being wagered on the coin flip. Then I'm going to define an address of player one and an address of player two. Now this make wager function, remember that if you define a value in the object when you're making a transaction to a contract, that value of ether will get passed into the contract that you can access in the message.value property. So we're going to set the wager equal to the message.value that's sent to the contract. And then I'm going to set player one equal to the message.sender, which is the address of whoever's calling the contract. Now, just a note, if you want a function to be able to accept ether and use it in the function, you need to define that the function is payable with this keyword payable in the function definition. You will always forget to do this and it will always cause errors in your code. So just try to keep it in the back of your mind that if you're writing a function that you want to be able to send ether to, just define it as payable. So I'm going to save that and I'm going to redeploy the contract into the deployed object. And we should be able to do deployed.makeWager and I'm going to say this is from account one, and I'm going to pass a value of, let's say, web 3twoway 5 comma ether. So I'm going to call make wager. It looks like it worked. And we should be able to check decipher.etherbalance deployed.address. And it looks like this contract actually does have 5 ether that got sent to it. Now for the accept wager function, we want to make sure that player two is actually sending the correct amount of ether to accept the wager before modifying the game state. So we can wrap everything in an if message.value is equal to wager, then the current transition the current state return true, and we're also going to set player two equal to message.sender. And if the message value is not equal to the wager, then we can just not do anything and return false. Now, this is perhaps a little bit naive, and I'll show why in a second, but let's just play this out. So remember, because this accepts ether in the message.value parameter, I need to define this function as payable. So we have this accept wager function written. Let's redeploy the contract. And remember, we can check the state of the contract by doing deploy.currentState.call, so we see it's in state zero. So we'll do what we did before, which is make wager from account one of five ether. And we could see that the current state is now in state one, and we could see that the ether balance of the contract is five. Now let's take a look at how much ether account two has right now. So it looks like account two has all 100 ether that he's been preceded with. So we're going to say deployed dot accept wager and this will be from account two and the value that we're going to pass in is not going to be five ether let's say we accidentally pass in slightly less we pass in four ether so this should not be true so this should go to the return false aspect of this so we'll do accept wager it looks like it probably didn't work because the contract is still in state one but if we look at the ether balance of account two, it actually took that four ether out of his account and sent it to the contract. So if I did the ether balance of the contract right now, we'll see that the contract has nine ether. And that is not what we wanted to do. We wanted to just reject the message dot value that he sent. And this is where throwing an exception is going to come in handy. Because remember, throwing an exception will error out the contract and not make any of the state transitions that probably would have happened otherwise. Because this is still a valid runtime pathway for the contract to go down. So it's still accepting all of the ether. So if instead of returning false, we throw at the end of the exception here and then rerun this back. So we will redeploy the contract and then we will make a wager from account one. We can check the ether balance of account two, it's 95.99. And let's say we try to accept the wager, but pass in four ether again from account two. Well, now we get an exception because that throw, nothing actually happens. And if we look at the ether balance of account two, it's still 95.99. 
So that is a way to ensure that the message value is not sent accidentally unless it's the right amount. So let's try to send the right amount now. So let's try to send five ether. And it looks like that went through correctly. The ether balance is gone. The state of the contract is in state two, which is waiting to resolve the bet. And the contract's balance is 10. And we're going to flip a coin, and we're going to send 10 ether to whoever wins. Now, modeling randomness on the blockchain is a notoriously tricky problem. You don't have access to a math.random function the way that you would in other programming languages. And there are a variety of different approaches you can take to try and get random numbers in your Ethereum smart contracts. Each of them have their own pros and cons. I'm just going to demonstrate a, an easy, if not slightly convoluted way that you can get random numbers. And then in future videos, I'll show some more complex but more robust ways if you really wanted to use random numbers in your actual production smart contracts. So the first thing to know is that if you ever wanted to know the current block that your blockchain was on, we could do web3.f.block number. So my little test RPC right here is on block number 26. If we ever want to get information about a block, we can do web3.f.getBlock and pass in the block number. So in this case, it was 26. We do get block, and we'll get information about the current, the latest block. So we can see information includes the transactions that were mined inside of it, the size, the difficulty, and then there's something called a block hash. Now, a block hash is a, a 64 digit string that is very much random, that is a hash of a lot of different information, including the transactions that were mined into the block. So if we could get access to this block hash, we would have something that's kind of random-ish enough, and we could manipulate that in some way to act as a random number for the purposes of our coin flip. Inside of our Solidity contract, we can get access to the current block number with the block.number property. Now, it would be great if we could just get the hash of the current block this transaction is being mined into, because then we would have a random number. But because the hash is created partially from all the transactions inside the block, it's impossible to actually get the hash of the current block the function's being called in. But you can access the hash of previous blocks that have been mined. Now bear with me for a second here. I'm going to create a new variable of type uint called seed block number. Now when we accept the wager, I'm going to cache the value of the block that this block that this function is getting mined into by setting seed block number equal to block dot number. Now when we call the resolve bet function in a later block, we should be able to have access to the block hash of the seed block number that was cached when we hit the accept wager function. So I should be able to do block dot block hash of seed block number. Now I'm going to do something a little bit crazy. I'm going to open wolframalpha.com. You should already be terrified. Now there's a data type in Solidity that is a 256-bit integer. Because we're dealing with binary code, a 256-bit integer can have two to the power of 256 different possible values. So if we look at this number, it's some really big number here. Now if we force convert a block hash into a uint 256, it's going to be some value between zero and this number with an equally likely chance of being either of those values. So if I then divided this number by two, for example, and got the middle of that number, there is an equally likely chance that a type converted block hash would be either higher or lower than this number right here. So this is one way that we can mock out randomness. So I'm going to copy this number, and I am going to set a variable of type uint256 called factor and paste in the number here. And now I'm going to make a new variable of type uint256 called block value. And I'm going to set that equal to the forced type converted value of the block dot block hash of the seed block number. Then I'm going to 
make a new variable of uint 256 called coin flip that is just going to divide the block value by the factor. And this variable is going to have an equally likely chance of being either zero or one. So I could then do something like this where I say if coin flip is equal to zero, then player one dot send this dot balance. And then we can set the current state to no wager. We can return true from the function. Or else we could player two dot send this dot balance, which is the balance of the contract. And then we can copy these two lines down. And this right here is an actual implementation of a coin flip. We essentially have a two-sided die, but we could make an n-sided die if we really wanted to. If we just divided this by four, then now there's a one-fourth chance that the block uint256 block hash divided by this will be zero. So we could make any n-sided die out of this kind of mathematics if we really wanted to. So I forgot a semicolon here, but I think we're ready now to test this bad boy out. So let me do var deployed equals decipher dot deploy contract and then pass in flipper. That is now deployed. We can do deployed dot make wager and we'll do make this from account one and we'll pass in a value of web three dot two way. Let's make this a, a big one, 25 ether. And we could check, we can verify the game state by checking deployed.currentState.call. We are in state one. So now we can do deployed.accept wager from account two value web 3.2 way 25 comma ether. We can look at the current state and we are in state two ready to resolve the bet. Let's check the balances of everyone's accounts. So we can do deploy dot ether balance. I'm sorry, decipher dot ether balance account one, which is 54 something, account two, which is 65 something. And of the deployed contract, it's exactly 50. So now I'm going to do deployed dot resolve bet. And I'm going to pass, make this from account one. It doesn't matter which account I'm calling it from. And it looks like it did transition the state. So if I look at current state.call, we are in state zero. And if I look at the ether balance of the contract, it's got zero. So somebody won this. Let's hope that it worked. And if we look at the balance of account two, he's got 115. So it looks like account two was our lucky account that got paid out. Account one got screwed. I know that that was a lot of information and this is a little bit messy, but I just wanted to illustrate a slightly more complex contract to show the kinds of problems that you will get into as you're developing production contracts in the wild. So we are gonna keep going and we've got another interesting contract example coming up next.